Welcome back into Mining Stock Daily in this week's long form episode here on the podcast. A somewhat still ill Trevor Hall as your host once again this week with a special long form episode with a very special returning guest, the Koala. I was able to spend some time with Koala in London during LME week not too long ago. So this is kind of a a rehash of our key takeaways from those few days there in London and also discussions he had from some of the major miners and producers uh, throughout the world uh, as he extended his trip through Europe. Uh, Key takeaways, what he learned, what's new, what's not, uh, what we learned through the uh, production quarterly financials and, and all the things. So a lot of takeaways here of the things to be watching for when it comes to uh, base metals, uh, industrial metals, and coal. So we'll keep talking about that. Special thank you to Western Copper and Gold, Fireweed Metals, and Arizona Sonoran Copper for their, their continued support of the podcast. And uh, I'm going to try to rest my voice here for the rest of the weekend and be back uh, healthy and better, ready to go on Monday. So here's my conversation with Koala, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend and be well. Welcome back to Mining Stock Daily, everybody. Uh, if, uh, somewhat ill, continued illness, Trevor Hall here, your host for this long form episode. Uh, but I did pack and started brewing up some eucalyptus tea here to soothe my ills and welcome in Koala himself to the long form episode this week on Mining Stock Daily. So, Koala, good to see you. How are things? Uh, jet lagged, sir. Jet lagged. <laughs> but I guess that means uh, th- I guess that means I don't have to be brief. You don't want to do the talking. <laughs> I don't want to do any of the talking. <laughs> but you know that's no different than any of our other conversations here, Koala. So, uh, you know, you and I got to spend a little bit of time in London over LME week. That was uh, a ton of fun, I might add, uh, and kind of getting to see you in your element. I'm usually only witnessing you on on the Twitter sphere and then, you know, here in these conversations, but uh, give me a sense of, you know, those key takeaways in London that week, because you were awfully busy. You know, the funny thing is about Europe, Trevor, it's the little differences. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd actually say one of the most profound uh, realizations I had came not uh, from the meetings at LME week, but, running around the three neighborhoods of London that kind of dominate the LME week calendar, you notice things like you notice the line outside the Guyard, if I'm pronouncing that right, doesn't really matter. (laughs) The Guyard uh, luggage store in Mayfair. And you notice in Paris, the lines outside Guyard and Louis Vuitton. And then you hear about how nickel and cobalt are probably going to go the way of aluminum because Chinese capital is flooding into Indonesia to HPAL, the whole archipelago, where basically if you take it to its extreme and fully dramatic sense, China is basically going to strip mine Indonesia until there's no islands left. Throw all that ore, laterite ore, into, a, into an HPAL and flood the world with nickel and cobalt and uh, – Actually, even stuff like scandium that's in the laterites and low grades uh, because um, they figured out HPAL. took 30, 40 years, um, but, uh, you know, Twiggy's anaconda nickel disaster at Murren Murren uh, had to happen so that uh, 30 years later, China's figured this out the same way in the 2010s. They realized they had all this uh, cheap domestic thermal coal and aluminum is an industry that grows by 5 7% a year, and yet – you look at this today and you go, how's the aluminum market grown so much in the last decade? And yet Rio's acquisition of Alcan still looks like one of the worst M&A decisions uh, in years, not just because of the fact that they used all cash and leverage right into the GFC to do it, but because Rio Tinto's aluminum business has only once uh, exceeded $3 billion of EBITDA since the acquisition, and that was a $38 billion deal. Hmm. So even the nickel producers 
are saying, Nickel, it's never been more over. And the one potential saving grace is if people are going to actually care about where their materials come from. Is ESG real? And in that sense, a ton of aluminum powered by a coal-powered smelter in China has 40 tons of aluminum, if I recall the quote I was told, versus a ton of aluminum coming out of a Rio Alcan smelter in Canada powered by hydro has two tons. Right. Well, is that ever going to matter? Because if that starts to matter for aluminum and nickel, then maybe it makes sense to care about nickel and cobalt um, in the West. And I then pair that with a great slide Rio did on their iron ore site visit, which was going on during LME week, where they point out that the West is focused on DRI, um, EAFs, high, higher quality iron metallics to decarbonize steel, whereas there are still traditional blast furnaces being built in Asia. So the scope three of steel in a globalized world is also going to be a question. And I bring this back to my comment about the line outside Goyard, because I think what the West needs to realize when they um, criticize, castigate, and God, what is the word I'm looking for here? Um, but basically call the Westerners who are trying to supply commodities ethically to the world evil scum of the earth is they need to realize there is going to be a line outside of Gouillard and Louis Vuitton no matter what. And whether mm -hmm. that line is filled with women from the Gulf wearing the hijab from a culture that doesn't necessarily value both genders <clears throat> of the world equally – and Russian blondes from a country run by a dictator? Or is that line going to be filled with folks who are trying to provide the copper, the oil, the metals, the building blocks of life in an ethical way? That is, it, to me, it was the biggest takeaway from LME Week to me was looking at that and saying that line clearly the wealth in that line is coming from commodity wealth mm -hmm. all over the world. That wealth will be made, and the evil people are not the people trying to deliver the building blocks of civilization and modern er modernity um, to a Western world-class standard. And that's really, I think, a conversation that is going to have to start happening because – you can say we don't want oil drilled in the Permian. We don't want a natural gas pipeline from the Marcellus across New York State into New England. So cheap natural gas from the U.S. powers New England's electricity and heating in the winter instead of LNG. But we actually have to start having these conversations. The question is, will it actually matter? Will the Western consumer actually care about this when it hits them in the pocketbook? Uh, whether through higher electricity prices, uh, tariffs meaning that a Western battery-powered EV costs more than a Chinese-made uh, and imported car. As one fund manager in Paris said to me, 90% of the Teslas in Europe come from the Shanghai plant. Yeah. That, that, stagger, that was staggering to me. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the sweet irony that a car is assembled with a... Even if you want to say, oh, Tesla buys the credits or buys the renewables elsewhere to offset, at the end of the day, the Chinese grid is the Chinese electrical grid. Yeah. As simple as that. So that to me was the the big thing, this um, what I'll just call the Goyard Louis Vuitton hypocrisy. That it just stood out to me so glaringly. Because you kind of have big producers of some of these commodities now saying, Yeah, either people start caring. Or what's the point? You know, let me push back a little bit here, Koala, because I've seen those lines as well. And those lines in metropolises and cities like London are a much different beast than what you might see in other cities in the West, obviously. Um, you know, London is its own animal. But what were your takeaways? That, like, 
walking by like a J. Crew or Banana Republic. You know, I mean, I mean, the the, the spending has got the consumer has got to come from somewhere. And yes, when you talk about a Louis Vuitton, you're getting an upper wealth class of of people who can actually afford those goods. I mean, so is it fair to look at that and say, you know, to, to be that your key takeaway? Um, is it? I mean, are you are do you are you? It can kind of sense like the West is trying to destroy wealth rather rather than trying to build up societal. Uh, wealth and sustainability? I think it's the fact that while commodities are cyclical and natural resources are cyclical um, over a very long time horizon, these cycles can be very long. Um, the truth of the matter is there's not really a better business in the world than a first quartile long life producer of a commodity good that the world needs to consume for its modern needs and for improving standards of living in a growing magnitude so and the cost structure of those extraordinary world class assets means ebitda margins in excess of 50% some cases 70% can produce extraordinary wealth um mm -hmm. and if you come from the west and you've had success in that realm. You are raping and pillaging the earth. You are evil. You are a disgrace. And you should be taxed to the gills. And you should be. You're, you're everything you shouldn't be. And yet you see things. But the reality is someone's going to make that wealth. Mm -hmm. Someone is going to go find those great minds. Someone's going to build those great minds, and those are actually heroes of the modern age. They're not villains, especially when they're doing their best to do it right. Can you open up this conversation about China and Indonesia in the nickel market a little bit more? Uh, <clears> that's a little, you know, that's a that's an interesting new take that we haven't covered here. Uh, is it? Is it? Factual? I mean, is it hyperbole? I mean, what is this? What's going on there? Look, it started with nickel pig iron, which was taking the ore, the saprolite ore from the uh, from the laterites in Indonesia, throwing it in a boat, taking it to China, and throwing it into a uh, and turning it into nickel pig iron by throwing it straight into the furnace. Mm -hmm. Create a five percent nickel content steel instead of using a fifteen percent ferro nickel or taking a hundred percent nickel piece of metal and throwing it in and melting it. It just it short circuited, but obviously a lot of one percent nickel ore, you throw that into a furnace, a lot of stuff goes up the smokestack. Then Indonesia obviously said, well why are you making the the nickel pig iron in China? Make it here, we're gonna ban ore exports, <laughs> which leads to another big broader thematic here, which is People want more and more value add processing in the home country. Um, so then nickel pig iron starts happening, but now the real value in nickel is in batteries. And right. So the question is, how do you create uh, nickel in a form that is amenable to producing a nickel sulfate? And HPAL, there's a lot of tragedies. Uh, a tragedy is the wrong word. Uh, economic catastrophes, whether that was uh, Anaconda Nickel with Murrin Murrin. Or Ravensthorpe used to read BHP asset before First Quantum got it for a song. Uh, these things are hard to do. Goro, another example uh, in New Caledonia. Um, and simply put, um, it's taken a really long time to get HPAL kind of to become reliable in the Chinese period of crack this code in Indonesia. They're building them. They're building more of them. And it's getting nickel into solution in a way that they can go down the battery nickel path instead of going and saying, okay, we have ferro nickel. Now we got to separate the nickel from the, from the steel and iron and then turn it into, uh, yeah. call it class two to class one. And look, HPAL, I mean, HPAL being high pressured acid leach for anybody yes. who didn't know. 
Yeah. So just throw that in there. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify. But uh, well, but this is interesting news. I mean, you talk about the nickel market with, between China and Indonesia, and there's been, and not, I wouldn't say like a tremendous amount of talk, but there has been news about China's graphite market, and they're restricting graphite exports now. That's been the news coming out. I mean... <laughs> It almost, I mean, I don't, it's not necessarily, I don't, I don't know. Is this kind of a cold war of resources between China and the West? Or is this mainly China saying, we see the future, we're going to do whatever we can do to provide sustainable, sustainable growth for our people and our partners while the West kind of, you know, flutters around until worse comes to worse. Graphite's a funny thing because if you actually think about it, most of the graphite we use in the world is synthetic because it's mm-hmm. reliable in shape and scope. And synthetic graphite comes from the petroleum industry, uh, which is a little bit of uh, the tables have turned or how the turn mm-hmm. tables situation. And look, China slams the brakes on things every now and again to change uh, industrial behavior, consumer behavior. We all remember the rare earth mania in 2010, 2011, in no small part because of an argument over a Japanese fishing fleet or it was a Chinese fishing fleet near Japanese islands. Point really doesn't matter which is which. It's just um, that, look, there are bottlenecks in a globalized world of maximum trust. Certain areas of comparative advantage got significant stakes in certain commodities, whether that's the upstream or the midstream processing. And it's cliche to say it, but we exported a lot of deflation and emissions to China during their rise to today, probably the second most powerful country in the world um, through their industrialization. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. And if we're going to go to a world where we care about scope three emissions and there's less trust and there's now spheres or a carbon curtain, if you will, uh, comes across the Pacific ocean uh, between the Atlantic community and uh, China. Um, that is naturally structurally inflationary. It's going to require the replication of several existing capacities, uh, but that's, Kind of similar in the vein of if we're trying to replace a fossil fuel powered economy and infrastructure with an electrified infrastructure, that means not only uh, rethinking the electrical grid, it's rethinking generation, the materials required. It's a, and it's talking trillions of dollars. And net zero 2050 is almost only just about 25 years away. And in 25 years, we want to talk about <clears throat> replacing things that we built basically over the course of 120 years since mm-hmm. what was the Model T, 1905. I mean, mm-hmm. that's when the petroleum industry and electricity really kind of kick into gear. Yeah. I mean, these, uh, are, these are massive problems that require massive amounts of capital and massive long-term vision um, in a world where our industry, sure, there's been a little bit of a re-rating for the majors, in terms of their multiple on the margin compared to the rest of the industry. But we're just now starting to have this conversation where it's no longer about give me all the money back uh, and all the free cash flow back um, because we need to decapitalize this industry because this industry is a destroyer of value. We are just now starting to have this conversation that you know it actually makes sense that these companies reinvest where they can provide sensational returns. Well, it's we started just to now see that starting to have that yeah. conversation. Yeah, I think in the last year or so, Koala, we've started seeing some of those major companies start to kind of put their you know dabble their feet into waters and earlier stage <clears throat> type of development plays. Excuse me, but I do I do want to go back I, I do want to go back there. I mean, you mentioned twenty five years away from twenty fifty. I mean, even if you've got something permitted today, you're still fifteen years away from actually producing in a tier one 
And we don't have too many projects have that tier one status that aren't even close to permitting in construction. So even if you started today, you'd be lucky to break even in 2050, wouldn't you think? It's these things take time. Right. Um, but who's thinking about who's thinking about other than the, the, the producers like the, the Rios, the BHPs, they they understand 25, 50 years down the road. They get that. They, but outside, they, they outside, just now, outside those companies, they don't. It seems like everybody's just like waffling here. They don't well, get we it. Need to, we need to have a conversation about um, optionality. Um, and I think a good example of this is. It's hard enough now to get people to understand companies aren't valued at NAV because no one believes the NAV. And given recent events with delivering projects on time, on budget, even if you spot them one CapEx adjustment, uh, still not enough bandwidth. But Escondida, the biggest cop mine in the world, in fiscal year 2013, produced from the mill. This doesn't include the cathode, but from the mill, 866,000 tons of copper. Um, and in that was in 2023. In 2013, it did 863. Now, normally, this is the beginning of a conversation point where people say, oh, my God, look at the Escondida grade decline and how the reserve grade in copper. I actually think we've missed a very important point here instead, which is in fiscal year 2013, Escondida milled. 74 million tons in this most recent year it milled 131 million tons so there's been a lot of capital sunk into escondida to stay running in place from a production perspective but i think what's very what that tells you though is there's been a lot of optionality in the escondida pit in the escondida i mean escondida has been around for decades now mm -hmm. where you sit there and say you know phase one of an operation is not the final set plan for these operations. Um, there's just, it's easier sometimes to do a smaller scale phase one operation, get things running, get some cash flow, get the team working together before you go for a big expansion that leads to the final end game. But NAV is. We sink this capital, we get a bunch of free cash flow. It's very hard to get to a world where then people say, oh, but in year five, we're going to do an expansion and that will lead to this. Or the optionality of what to do with the free cash flows within these massive ore bodies um, that are really just special. And I look, I think a good example of that, given when I checked before we went on to get and started chatting, Philo put out an amazing, amazing hole. Looks like they maybe found another the be, the beginnings of another Brescia zone, Aurora zone, something beautiful within that amazing porphyry system. And yet the stock is flat. How do you get investors to understand now while this all sits in many different companies right now? Why does BHP own seven percent of BH of Philo? Well, because if we consider the Jose Maria project, which I think should be called Vicuña Phase One, um, that's probably going to cost six, seven billion dollars of capex to do, on average, one hundred fifty thousand tons of copper over the course of its reserve life. But with high grading, uh, the early starter pit and targeting the rich parts, maybe get two hundred thousand tons a year in the first mm -hmm. seven, eight, ten years. And that's a when I look at the last technical report from 2019-2020, that's a 0.6% copper equivalent resource. So eh, that's very capital intensive. It feels like, oh, this feels QB2. <laughs> but who knows? In 10 years, why can't there be a tunnel targeting the Aurora zone or another high-grade zone within Philo or within Luna Hasi at NGX? And instead of putting 0.6 copper equivalent through this mill, you could be putting 1, 1.5, dare I say 2% copper equivalent. Now, why do I say that? Because first of all, you go, oh, linearly, that would be great, Koala. That's a 2x of production. That's a 3x of production. But what that also means 
is you might have to put more capital into Jose Maria because if you're floating, if you're if you're floating more copper in the flotation circuit, you're going to need more roughing capacity, more cleaning capacity, more concentrate uh, packing capacity, um, and that's all capital. Mm -hmm. um, but someone might look today and go, "Oh, that doesn't look so special." But it's the beginning of an amazing multi-phase journey that can create a lot of value um, if you believe in copper because the opportunity to deploy what eventually will be Escondida scope of capital for Escondida-like production that will run until our grandkids, <laughs> our, gra right. our grandkids will be having kids. That's that's something special, but how do you right. explain that in a world of public equities when on the hedge fund side, if you have one bad year, you maybe get a second bad year, but three bad years in a row performance-wise, you're gone. It doesn't really matter what you've done before, and in the multi-manager world, which has come to very much dominate um, part most – some of the hedge fund world, it's all about the path. It's not about the destination. Uh, because these com these firms want to lever up, be market factor neutral. So it's all about what can you do for me this week or next, mm -hmm. and that's why I I, I proudly say yeah. I as I as a as a failed pod monkey, uh, I'm an investor, because frankly to do this industry any other way is is to basically commit yourself to an insane asylum. You <laughs> might not be insane when you commit yourself, but you spend you spend enough time around the loonies, you'll go loony. <laughs> Yeah, uh, straight jacket equivalents. Just kind of watching the charts of some of these companies here anymore. But you know, but you you mentioned the, uh, the a tunnel. You know, a great example of that is actually right here in Colorado between the Climax Mine and the Henderson Mine of Freeport, and they've got a very long tunnel between those two projects that just keeps on cranking away Molly, which is. It's pretty fascinating. So obviously it can be done. It's a great example, a great idea here. And it just made me think of that, Koala. Um, listen, we, we finished up uh, the quarter. We finished up Q3. We've seen financials and production numbers. Uh, we go to London and you get a bunch of the, you know, obviously you're having conversations with some of the big boys. Uh, key takeaways from from the quarter as far as the financials go. Uh, you know, what are we seeing and what are we not seeing? I... I I think there's a renewed understanding slowly creeping up that, you know, iron ore, which is probably right now one of my preferred uh, areas to be, um, you're seeing Rhodes Ridge being built by Rio to help solve the depletion issues they have in the Pilbara. You have a very real question of um, – and we're talking not stuff that matters for the next six months, but things that matter for the net for the 2020s and 2030s. What's the role of Fortescue's lower grade material in a world where we care about the emissions of steel and we want green steel? Um, a big question out of Brazil is Vale getting their the last of their dams certified, getting a few of their brownfield projects done and kind of restoring themselves back to not the 400 they used to talk about. I think they are at 320 and they'd like to maybe get to 350 um, if market merits it, but getting them to the ability where they have the pellet feed um, and the exact specs in that 350 that they can do 100 million tons of pellets, DRI, HBI, pellet feed, um, super high grade um, material, but I think the other big interesting thing here is I think everyone's kind of realized there's, it's really hard to do deals in this sector. Um, everyone wants to talk about capital allocation. There really wasn't a lot of conversations like, oh, costs are up here, there. I, I mean, look, we'll get to QB2 because, <laughs> my God, what a – that was fun. I had a little too much fun, but it was so easy. It was You're so very easy active. forever. Yeah, you it were was very so active. easy. It was so easy, and it was so fun. It had to be done. Um, 
I'm sorry. I, I just don't know what Vancouver based CEO of a Canadian champion volunteers for a 5 a.m. conference call. N- yeah. Never seen that one before. But look, Glencore Tech is a whole co transaction that, that seems dead. Um, Lion Town, uh, Gina Reinhart with Western Australian resource nationalism against an American company. Who saw that one coming? And looks like overnight, she's trying to get to 19.9% on Azure Minerals. Also WA Lithium with a bid from SQM Public. Uh, Sigma has been rumors all year. And there's a news release from the company in September saying they expected to announce something by the end of the year. And I mean, it's, it's almost November, Trevor. Right. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And look, I mean, you also hear things like uh, for a lot of these public copper multiples for producers who have assets that majors would want, the math just doesn't work. And anywhere the Chinese can bid anymore, their cost of capital just blows any other bid out of the water. Mm -hmm. But then you talk to the companies from China. And you start hearing things along the lines of, yeah, we were probably high bid on that. And then we got a call from the host government kind of saying, could you politely go away, please? We don't really want you here. So it's really hard for these companies who are looking to do deals to get the alignment of interests, get the egos aligned on the assets that they want. What is a Rio, BHP, Glencore, Anglo, Tech, Freeport asset at a valuation that makes sense, there's something to be said about when you take an entrepreneurial endeavor in mining, you discover something extraordinary, you build something extraordinary that's worthy of the majors, the value of wanting to continue to have the upside but also sleeping well at night. And look, I'll, I'll just use Patriot as an example of this. The December 21 raise, 11 million flow through. So do the hard money on the back. Let's call it 6 million Canadian. The March 22 raise was 3 million bucks. So call it 10 million Canadian hard dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, When it's all said and done, if you look at what the Azure valuation implies, you look at what the Lion Town valuation implies, that's 10 million Canadian that is probably been a hundred bag when you include the warrants call it 48 million shares and plus warrants 50 cents all in i look at that and like there's a there's the romance of going the distance but it's really hard to actually build a new world-class producer off a world-class asset um because it takes time you talked about before you find something today you're five, 10 years away, and in these public markets, people get a little wobbly if for six months or a restock, destock cycle. It's just a roller coaster. Why go through that when a Rio, a BHP, a Glencore can come to you and say, you have found something worthy of us. Take stock in us. Get your dividends. Get your buybacks. Get the fact that we either are giving you some money back in dividends. We're buying back stock at attractive multiples. We're deploying capital at 15, 20% IRRs and over a long enough time horizon, if they're right, the returns on capital of these businesses and thus to shareholders will converge with the returns they're getting deploying capital before any multiple re-rating. Uh, I look at that and I say, you can sleep pretty well at night. So the whole thing is, I think it's become time and we're, I think it's a 24-25 thing is that we're going to start to see on the rare things that actually are worthy of the majors that aren't already in the majors, I think we're going to see majors start offering stock Hmm. um, as a way to um, bring things in and allow you to continue to have some upside. But bring stuff in because the discoveries have been – the big discoveries worthy of the majors aren't happening within the majors. No, they certainly are. With Winu, we need to see what Rio's discovery in WA that they mentioned five years ago, but it's clearly a very nice deposit from what they've disclosed. But is it a Rio Tinto asset? 
time will tell and more research has to be done. But BHP spends a billion dollars a year on exploration, Trevor. Um, Philo is Escondido. Philo Vicuña is Escondida of this century. It's been found. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And oftentimes, too often, we learn the lessons that the explorers and developers are not the ones that should be taking projects into construction and operation. Um, and I think the industry and the investors understand that because we've learned those lessons over and over again. And you had mentioned, I think the last time you and I chatted, Koala, about what it took for Robert Freeland to keep his face and name on Kamoa Kakula, how much he had to give to keep that whatever upside he could. Um, and I think he, obviously he did, he's doing pretty well, uh, but to have any more upside would have been really, really challenging for him. We talked about that. Now, what does it mean for these? I want to go back to the lithium because that was a theme that came up in London for me quite a bit was you had all these kind of M&A deals on the table. And then it, right now, it just seems awfully quiet. If not, these deals aren't going to go through. I mean, was that M&A activity a sign of a really hot market more than anything else? And what's it going to take to get some of these deals across the line now? I think if you're in Western Australian lithium, there's clearly something between Gina's agenda. I've never before seen a billionaire buy 20% of a com company and basically kill a deal <laughs> knowing basically immediately buy it at Aussie 3, they have to raise at sub Aussie 2. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a hell of a drawdown to take on day one. Um, you got to understand what the agenda there is. And I think it's very telling that the SQM Azure deal basically says that if someone comes in and tries to block this, SQM will basically just tender to anyone who wants it, which is basically, I guess, Gina said, I'm totally fine owning 15 to 19.9% .9 of Azure in partnership with SQM, which, all right. Um, and then I think there's egos. Um, I think there's something to be said for, you know, to quote Logan Roy, take the fucking money. <laughs> Um, I think you have to look around and say, if you're, if you're willing to sell and said, you've done your purpose, you, you move on. Um, egos are a, egos can be amazing things, but they also can destroy deals. They can prevent you from saying no to initial offers because you think you're a market darling. Um, and then there's a pullback and that number is no longer there. Um, it's an ego that can have you say, you know, I'm still going to be involved. I'm going to run a foundation um, funded by a royalty and I'm going to make sure everything's done ESG and right. And look, I've said this to a few folks, but I mean, when you're buying an asset as a major, it's like picking a wife. Um, you know, it's not all going to be perfect. There's always going to be an issue here or there, but you fall in love and you're ready to spend the rest of your career, the rest of your life, because the great minds run long past our lifetimes. Um, it's truly uh, till death do us part. Um, but then, I don't know, you hear the mothers moving in with you. <laughs> it's a different uh that's a, that requires a little more diligence <laughs> so look yeah. egos egos uh, egos uh egos egos play a role and you actually need to make sure that uh people want you have to understand people's motivations and i was talking about this with a couple of majors just socially it's it there's a reason there's not a lot of deals it's so hard to do deals it's i mean i hate to talk i hate to bring up Glen Tech again, but if the tech name is so important to Kivel, just say I want the company name Tech. I don't think Glencore really cares. It's not like the Glencore brand name is that great to begin with, given I don't know everything that's happened. Mm. A rebrand would be lovely. 
Yeah. Is it um, <laughs> is it about economics? Is it about it's about what what motivates people? I mean, there's surely some tech board members who have just been like, let's just do the deal. But the man in charge who has the class A shares for the next five years till the sunset, he just doesn't want to do a deal. Um, it's and look, what's a deal that's actually happened, Trevor? Ironically, mm. a coal deal. Yeah. Uh, BHP selling Blackwater Donner, well, BMA, which is 50% BHP, 50% a Japanese uh, consortia. Um, but between divesting Thermal, divesting BMC to Stanmore, the decision to, to divest these assets was made years ago by BHP. And these majors are like super tankers. To turn them takes time. But once you've got them pointed in the direction they want to go, the momentum is terrifying. Right, right. right. Um, right. But there's a position there where, you know, yeah, in, in the terrible coal market of 19 and 20, Blackwater didn't really make money. But – in the world we're in today and in a world of more years of lack of investment and, frankly, quality deterioration, um, Blackwater looks like a very interesting asset. But these were decisions that were made years ago, and there's only so few people who actually you would trust as BHP to actually operate mines in Australia, which is basically – your homeland. You don't want these assets to go wrong and then get boomeranged back to you, where the government calls you and says, "This is actually your problem because you sold for the highest dollar amount, but to people who didn't know how to run a mine properly to our standards." Um, and then the recognition of we don't need to get the most dollars here. We need to put these assets with people who know how to operate, who will pay us an acceptable number, we, where we can think about. Uh, structuring the deal where we get our number, but they have, can access the capital they need to do the deal, and everyone wins. Like that blackwater Donya deal, everyone wins. The alignment was there. Um, and you can see that in the fact that two times spot EBITDA, three times consensus EBITDA. Uh, you know, at Spot Newcastle, using the guide for the current fiscal year, Whitehaven was trading on a higher higher multiple of EBITDA. It is an accretive deal. So everyone everyone kind of wins there, but what's it, it's it's finding that alignment, finding the egos. People don't want to lose their jobs. Well, it's, I know we're kind of at a, you're at a loss of words here and <laughs> my words sound terrible right now, but you you talked about what it would take to get these projects through and what we're missing here is a conversation about People, the people capable of Completely. taking on projects and in operating, and I'm not talking about the C-suite people that can get deals done. I'm talking about the people on the ground that understand no mining, have studied mining, engineering, geology, all the sciences. There is a lack of human resources in this industry right now. Uh, so we can talk about the lack of tier one, how, lack look, of supply. How many people? All we want. How many people? have been responsible for delivering a 100,000 ton per day or greater copper mine greenfield that are left in this industry. Not many. I mean, if you think about what, what's actually – the one saving grace for the – really for the things that are – basically the only two things I can think about off the top of my head, Trevor, that are – that are on the come in the next couple of years, FID wise, would be Facunia Phase One and Rikadek. Um, so, when, when it, it, I'd rather be building when no one's building because I can attract the best talent to the best projects. But we, we run a huge risk, and I'll use an example here. I mean, in one of the last booms, May two thousand and seven, Tech and Nova Gold announced they were starting construction. On Galore Creek with a $2 billion yeah. CapEx estimate. November 2007, they halt construction on the project because within less than six months, Trevor, they realized that the actual CapEx was going to be closer to $5 billion than $2 billion. And Don Lindsay, to his credit, 
just said, stop. Just stop. We don't have this under control. Right. I mean, you, you want, if you're going to do big bet the company like projects, make sure you have the A team. Well, with the CapEx overruns that we're seeing, I mean, that's a general theme. We saw it this week with QB2 as well. <laughs> Speaking of more tech tech stories, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, this, these CapEx overruns, as we as investors, it's it seems like we're our, our own worst enemies sometimes because we will, you know, put out graphs of the supply demand curves for any certain commodity up on our social media feeds day in, day out. And that's our bull cases. But we see these CapEx overruns almost every single week in so many different projects. And we talk about, oh, they're mismanaged. They don't understand. They should have, we should have put at least another 50% CapEx over and, you know, built into the, built into the line items, into the finances here. And so we talk about these bull cases passively on social media, and then we cry woof when we actually see the difficulties with the cost and resources that it takes to get these projects over the line. Do we need to come to grips with ourselves as investors here to understand that, you know, things may look pretty, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, but right now we've really got to wade the waters and, 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 and really come to grips with ourselves and what our expectations are. Look, the one project that comes to mind that is was delivered on time on budget was Kakula Phase One, hmm. and ironically, that happened during COVID because my understanding is the guy in charge of that, Mark Farron, basically didn't leave didn't leave the mine site for a year. He couldn't. <clears throat> Orzone's Bambore project in Burkina Faso came in time and under budget during COVID too. I mean, you got nothing else to do, and you're terrified to be near anyone unless you have to be. <laughs> People are shockingly focused. <laughs> um that's 2000 it's 2023 we can it's been enough it's been long enough move on but i i look at this and i think a biggest lament i think the biggest one here though trevor is copper because mm. these mines with the exception of kamoa kakula they are technically getting more and more complex they're at higher altitudes they're in more remote places. They're in more difficult places without an established mining tradition. They're deeper. I mean, resolution, you're going to have to have a giant refrigerator cooling down because the rock temperature is so, is so much at those depths in Arizona. Um, they're, but also copper to the point I mentioned earlier that public copper producers – Trade as if we're going back to four dollars a pound in the next twelve months, and to the point about the supply demand deficit always being eminent, because big copper mines are so rare, um, the multiples are different, and you see that in the Vale Base Metals uh, minority stake sale to the Saudi PIF and Engine One, just a pure copper nickel story just trades at a higher multiple, mm -hmm. um, which is ironic when, to quote someone I've known for a decade, said to me, Koala, I've been involved in copper for decades. Like, seen the, gr seen the great times, seen the bad times, seen the great assets, seen the bad assets. Copper is sexy. But you know where all the money is really made? It's in the bulks. They're not sexy. But iron ore, thermal coal, coke and coal, the bulks, even the like that that's where consistently the majority of the industry's money is made. And in copper, because everyone wants good copper exposure, people are building in anticipation of a four dollar or a higher copper environment. I ironically, the EBITDA of QB2, the first year it runs properly probably will look like the base case of the technical report or a little better because the technical report was run at three or 325 copper. Copper will be $375, $4. You'll have higher OPEX, I'm sure, than the 
because of inflation. But mm-hmm. you'll probably hit the numbers. Just probably like copper to be four fifty, given five something billion became eight bill eight point five billion. These aren't coal like returns, Trevor. Mm-hmm. And people are people are making big call options on higher copper prices. And look, perhaps as if the industry gets a little more religion, being contrarian and collecting call options will be a good thing. Uh, and I'll be the first to say this. I will forgive the COVID run up, the COVID delays. That was not something tech could have foreseen. I can wrap my head around one revision in the uh, construct in the CapEx big project. You go 20% over, okay, fine. Like things happen. I mean, let's use Alphaman, for example. Like one bridge goes out. So now they got to reroute a bunch of concentrate trucks. They also got to rewrite, reroute how they're getting in Palma South materials and equipment to the site. So a December commissioning becomes a February commissioning. Great. Things happen. That's life. Like, mm-hmm. that's why you have contingency, even though the contingency always gets used. And you, you move on. I can accept things happen. But what's terrifying is when these projects, you get one CapEx revision. Big, long enough project, one, re, one a year. When you are revising CapEx multiple times within one year, it implies you kind of lost control of the project. As, as one person said to me the day tech reported, how do you lose a drill bit or whatever on the seafloor so you have to then move the jetty and you've lost six months somehow in all of this, which, yeah, nothing you can do if you got to find it. So now the the war for the jetty is going to be finished in – 1Q24, but then I fast forward, but I, I rewind back to my notes from late 22, and I'm like, all right, great. What's the QB2 guidance going to be for costs during the 2023 ramp up? And what's like the production going to be? And the guide is, yeah, we're going to show copper without QB2. And, you know, the ramp's going to take some time. And, and then you sit there and go, yeah, and, you know, it's going to be great in 2024. It's just taking time to ramp. And, I mean, 70% run rate right now. I mean, is that going to be at 100 by the end of the year? Wait, the wharf got pushed. Like, mm-hmm. a man just. It's almost like it's very similar, but on a much bigger scale. Like, Weimar Republic inflation stories, where you go to order your coffee and you think you're going to pay for it with one price, but when the coffee comes out to it, it's a completely different price. You know, obviously, this is a much grander scale than a cup of coffee, but. It is like similar dynamics for for investors, right? Yeah, I think you. I think really, if you're going to build one of these projects, you really have to. You, you don't come out and talk about how great it is. Come out with a very sober and say, "We're building this. This is the returns. This is a thirty year call we're making." And one of the biggest issue, questions is. Is this going to be a six billion dollar bet, or is this going to be a seven eight billion dollar bet? History shows us that these things go out by twenty percent. Mm-hmm. So we've thought about that. Here's everything cons- we're doing. That's conservative right now. Twenty. Here's I mean, everything. What? Yeah. What? What should, what should we do? I mean, should we double it, triple capex expectations? Oh, I think you just have to acknowledge, like, look, when OT got delayed because of ground conditions, whether it was ground conditions once they finally got down there or they used really bad uh, quality steel in shaft too, so they couldn't – it took an extra year to delay the – to finish the shaft and get it to spec. Um, the reality is I remember because I was long turquoise hill into that uh, July 2019 gong show. It's still in my nightmares. Um, mm-hmm. You, you, I remember looking at it, just shell shock, watching a third of my PL for the year disappear in one day on a small position in the book and going, all 60% down days are fun, 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 fun. <laughs> and I looked and was like, yeah, like basically no matter what, with OT mobilized underground, you were going to burn 100, 150, 200 million dollars. Uh, so I'm like, so a six month delay is 200, 1.2 billion. Oh, FML. Like it's, you have so much mobilization at these places that 
it's like if one valve blows in a 10 step factory and until you replace the valve, you can't right. generate revenue. I mean, it should be appreciated how complicated these things are. It really yeah. should be. And so I think you just have to recognize people need to understand that's what also what makes these rare. It better be a brilliant enough resource and a brilliant enough project that those two or three years are worth it. Um, I, I do want to switch gears here as we wrap up here, Koala, and I want to get a better understanding of how you're watching the general global macro in front of these equities. Um, you know, you and I haven't talked much about global e uh, economies uh, outside of mining, really. But it's been really interesting where we're seeing precious metals and getting a safe haven bid, yet the precious metals equities are not looking great. Um, a lot of the metals themselves, the base metals we talked about, nickel and um, in, in, in other plays, you, you still like iron ore here. You know, but what is the headwinds here with the the unknowns of a, of the global economy and in this metals and mining space? What are you watching? I mean, I think everyone's just way too paranoid. Like, okay, 5% risk-free. Is the world ending? Doesn't is it seem really like risk -free? it. Is it really risk free? I don't know. Two, three percent real rates on a tip is. Uh, I mean, our mutual friend, the shrub. I mean, two, three yeah. percent of real rates, pretty damn compelling. I mean, if growth slows down, even if we have a little bit of a recession, I mean, I don't worry too much or focus too much about this because I think in my lifetime, there's been two traumatic economic events, the global financial crisis and uh, the COVID pandemic. I just don't think the dot-com bubble really compares, even sure. if it had a market impact. It was so localized to tech. Um, I think those two just sit there, and I think putting dot-com on that podium just is not fair. Um, and I think we're all conditioned as a result that we're waiting for the next 40% drawdown in a month. But we're, we're just wired. I mean, I think we all have right now, just because, listen, we put a huge crater in the global economy by telling everyone to stay home. And the Fed and central banks did what you do to fill a hole if you need to get everything out of a hole. They filled it, they filled it with liquid water in terms of liquidity, and they floated everyone to the top. Okay, now we got to drain that. We got to drain the hole a little bit by shoveling some dirt in, and occasionally we're now having water spill out a little bit. It's it's a little bit of a hangover. So yeah, we're not gangbusters right now. Um, I think we're having maybe the realizations that maybe whether it's digital gold or yeah, three percent renewables projects made sense. Um, you're seeing a little bit of a realignment of capital investment and I think priorities. Um, and so, yeah, things aren't booming right now, but I don't get the sense. I, the consumer seems pretty fine overall. I, I, and I'm not, to be clear, I don't think that's necessarily the case for all cohorts of the consumer, but at least the right. consumer that has discretionary, discretionary spend doesn't seem to be pulling back so much. There's still Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton, baby. <sighs> Oil's 90. And so, um, or, or and, Mayfair, whatever, whatever the story is. But I, I also look at this, and this is where I think some of the faster money guys and I de defer. Like, <laughs> the balance sheets on these companies, with the exception of one or two, are just... Yeah, it won't be fun if we have a bumpy t six to 12 months and earnings get cut in half and the stocks are down 30%, but there's no existential threat here. Um, yeah. If you're going to invest in these companies, um, you really actually have to think with a longer-term perspective. I don't trade that much. Um, the real irony of something like Whitehaven at three times is 
the buyback was very accretive. It was far more creative than a dividend, and there was nothing nothing else to use the capital on. Um, but the real power of buying something at three times, four times EBITDA is when it has a 30-year mine life is to say, the world's kind of telling you you're not going to need all 30 years. You get to year three, four, and five in the world, either you've gotten all your money back or it's been reinvested in high-returning projects, so the earnings power of what you own has grown too. Mm-hmm. Or the world's going to wake up and say, wait, how the fuck did the koala do that? Why didn't we do that trade? <laughs> wait, that trade's still there? We should do that. Like You can get potentially a re-rate, but also in our industry, if there's no investment, but because of reasons or beliefs or values, if there's still demand growing while supply is depleting, then – the long-term price is going higher, and if the long-term price is going higher, that means the numerator is going up organically. Um, but again, we're talking about things like optionality with some optimism and dreams that it's really hard because of the shell shock of the last decade and the shorter duration of capital. But also, I'll just say a personal theory. Uh, China cares about a better standard of living for its people, cleaner, healthier air, and staying in power. And you know what? If life's good, people don't want to complain. If life's not good or your children are sick or they don't have opportunity and you want to complain and you can't complain, that becomes a problem. So the inspiration there is it's not – it's never been politically feasible for China to have a recession. Um, Post-GFC and post-COVID, I just don't see a world where you see multiple years of extreme pain in the U.S. or the West where you wouldn't immediately see lax monetary policy. I, I mean, the, the, rea- the fiscal and monetary reaction in March 2020, an election year in the United States, no doubt, mm-hmm. was rapid. I, uh, I think life's too short from where I sit professionally and personally to try to predict if we're going to have one or two quarters of economic softness. I don't own things that if the commodity price isn't spot or 20% above spot in the next six months, I'm facing a chapter 11 liquidation. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not long out of the money short-term call options on these things. It's... It's about finding those things that can generate great returns. I mean, mm-hmm. what, what, what was Warren Buffett's comment about the Dow Jones did 5.3% real real compound in the 90s, which was a simply lovely return on a long enough time horizon? You know, mm-hmm. QB2 is ugly today, but if copper averages 450 and they've done the right automation and they get the thing running and hawing, maybe the IRR on that is comes out with a – 10 to 12 percent in due time maybe vicuña doesn't look that sexy on phase one but it looks pretty compelling once you think about phases two three and four Mm -hmm. i don't think anyone laments building escondida i don't think they lament building antamina um these things that if you have enough time and tech does have this right philosophically even though i do think they should care more about project execution and the first decade of something of a project, if you have a long enough time horizon, you ha- you get chances for mistakes to be forgiven. It's just mm-hmm. in the public markets these days, you can't do that. Yeah. Like, look, I'll I'll say this: short time I had, in my, I had my I had in my notes. To the same point about world class assets will end up with the existing majors. It would be crazy today to try to build the next Rio Tinto or the next BHP if you had a world-class asset. I mean, publicly. It, the roller coaster of having to deal with public investors would be crazy. If, if, if the koala was to build eucalyptus mining and say, I want to be the next major, I'll tell you right now the asset I would go get, to my point about um, 
timing the cycle and having time for errors to be forgiven, I would go get Baffin Land Iron Mines, Mary River Iron Ore Asset in the Arctic Circle of Canada, which EMG and Mattal bought in 2011, um, which has some of the highest grade iron ore in the world. It has reserves for decades and decades, including expansions. What's the problem? They bought it in 2011. It's been a roller coaster of a decade. People don't believe in iron ore anymore, but it's high quality iron ore. The natives to the north, the First Nations communities to the north of the island don't want them shipping more than the already existing six to six million tons uh, they do to the north. They are permitted to go south with a big railway and they'd have year round shipping, but they need a couple billion dollars to do it. So as one iron ore person said to me, the existing, par- the existing market participants have enough on their plate with their existing operations and their existing opportunities. But for someone with uh, a big set of balls who wants to go on a 10-year journey, you get that delivered. You have something with incredible optionality and something the world's desperately going to need. And then you have the platform to go do something amazing. But who who wants to sign up for that 20-year saga? I mean, think about Robert Friedland's line about Ivan O Mines. It's an overnight 25-year success. Koala, uh, my throat's still rough and my tea is out. So this would probably be a great opportunity to have this conversation come to a close. I appreciate all the time you give us here on the podcast and lots of thought to consider uh, it's great catching up with you in London. It's great catching up with you now. And uh, I assume we'll be hearing more from you before the end of the year. So thanks so much for your time. And uh, we'll see you on Twitter or X, Twitter X. Yeah, or maybe at another dinner. That was a fun one in London. Oh, man. Best dinner in London I had all week. All right, guys. That's a wrap here on the pod. We'll be back hopefully Monday morning with a better voice and a better sounding Trevor. Have a wonderful weekend and be well.